Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Our topic for this webinar is an introduction to power markets. This webinar is being presented by the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative, which is a project of the Clean Energy States Alliance, also known as CESA. Before I pass this over to our excellent speakers for the day, I'd like to go over a few quick webinar logistics. All of our attendees are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of the webinar. You can call in via telephone or you can connect via computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console, you can do so using the orange arrow that you see circled on your screen. You can also use that arrow to expand your webinar console. One thing you might like to do with that webinar console is to submit your questions and your comments. We'll be saving about 15 minutes at the end of our webinar for a Q&A with the audience. We'll get to as many questions as we can, so do type your questions in when you think of them. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will post the recording and a PDF of all the webinar slides on our website, cisa.org slash webinars, and we'll also send those out to you via email probably this afternoon. So with that out of the way, I will now pass it over to our moderator for this webinar, Warren Leon. Warren is the Executive Director of the Clean Energy States Alliance, and he is going to get us started. Hey, thanks very much, Samantha. Um, all you on the webinar have heard that this is being offered by the Clean Energy States Alliance, and here's a slide showing our members. We're a national membership organization composed of public agencies, mostly state agencies, and we work with them to advance renewable energy at the state and local level. And one of our projects is the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative, which you can see here. We are doing this uh, project in conjunction with the United States Climate Alliance. This project is working with those states that have 100% clean energy goals for their electricity sector, helping them share information, figure out how to achieve those goals and how to get additional states to adopt 100% clean energy goals. There are already 20 states plus the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico with 100% goals and we're actively working with all of them. If we could go to the next slide. Um, through the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative, we've been producing a range of resources. There's a guide to 100% Clean Energy States on our website. We've written a number of reports, as you can see on the right. A couple of the reports have to do with wholesale markets and how they work, because as you will learn in this webinar, that's a very important topic for enabling states to achieve their 100% clean energy goals. You have to understand how the wholesale markets work and you have to make some reforms to them in order to achieve 100% success. If we go to the next slide, um, our presenter today is going to be Bentham Paulus, who's a senior research associate for Clean Energy States Alliance, working particularly on the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative for us. And he's a principal in Paulus Analysis. Um, he's worked extensively with CESA on a wide range of projects. And let me turn it over to Ben for him to tell you about um, how wholesale markets work. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Warren. Um, everyone can hear me, I hope. Um, You're okay. Great, and uh, we are recording, so that's good. Um, welcome everyone uh, to Intro to Power Markets. This is Power Markets 101. Um, this uh, is derived from a report that I wrote as part of a series on understanding power markets. Um, this was sort of the first one. We start at the beginning with how they work. Um, and just a warning, this is very much um, power markets for dummies. So I wanna make sure you're in the right class. Um, if you know what VAR support is, you're probably in the wrong class. So this is for beginners only. And if you're, if you're that, then uh, you're in the right place. Um, 
So why should we worry about wholesale power markets in this transition to 100% clean? Um, well, it's pretty clear that uh, the 100% clean future is going to feature lots and lots of wind power and solar power. Um, wind and solar are <clears throat> driven by nature. Um, when the wind blows and the sun shines, that's when they produce power. They're not really driven by markets so much. Uh, so that makes them a poor fit for wholesale power markets that are premised on uh, what's known as the marginal cost of production. And I'll get to that in, in a bit to explain that term. Um, it's mostly fuel cost. Um, you operate your gas plant, your coal plant, uh, based according largely to the price of fuel. Um, to, uh, relative to the price of power in the market. Um, so in order to understand the implications of a nature-driven power source, um, we have to start with how power markets work today. So, and as I warned you, this is 101. Um, the first question is, how does electricity compare to normal products that we're much more familiar with, like say groceries? Um, is it a normal product? In some ways, yes, it is. Uh, the prices are set by supply and demand, uh, especially in competitive markets where you have generators competing with each other to, to supply the market. Um, disruptions can certainly affect prices. Um, you know, if a country should perhaps invade its neighbor, uh, that would affect the price of natural gas and oil. Uh, or if there should happen to be a large winter storm, that can certainly d make disruptions on the power supply and affect prices. Um, electricity also has a normal supply chain. It has producers, <clears throat> distributors, retailers, and customers like normal products do. But in other ways, it's not at all normal. Um, electricity requires real-time delivery. It's produced at exactly the same time, more or less, as it's delivered. Uh, there's very little storage. Um, <clears throat> there's, it's growing, but there's very little compared to the size of the whole market. Um, the price and the quantity can fluctuate dramatically just within a course of a few hours or a day. Um, it's not uncommon for prices to, for demand to double or triple in the course of a day and for prices to go from <laughs> zero or negative up to thousands of dollars per megawatt hour. Um, even hundreds of dollars in normal conditions. There's also a limited elasticity of demand and supply. Um, the price may vary a lot, but demand does not always vary so much in response to that price. Consumers use electricity to do what they're doing and may or may not respond to the price as it fluctuates. <clears throat> uh, there are also different kinds of grids. There are different maps of the energy world. Uh, this is the physical grid. Um, the elect U.S. electric system, some people call it the largest machine ever made. In some ways, it really is one big machine, uh, or to be more precise, three big machines. These are the three interconnections, these three regions, um, color-coded, the east, the west, and ERCOT in Texas. Um, they are all uh, physically interconnected. Um, synchronized um, according to the right frequency. <clears throat> um, altogether, we have about 7,300 power plants in the U.S. Um, between the interconnections, there are only limited connections. There are a few wires east to west, but they're not synchronized. They're DC wires. The circles on this map show what are called balancing authorities. Um, that's the region where the grid is physically balanced to make sure that supply and demand are always in sync with each other at all times. There are about 66 balancing authorities. You can see there are sometimes very large ones like MISO and PJM. And in many cases, they're very small ones like all these balancing authorities in Florida or in Arizona. <clears throat> but then there's also the money grid. Um, the money grid has its own map. It's a different map, um, mostly determined by weather markets. Well, it's determined by politics and by business. Um, there are seven organized markets. These are the colored zones here. They're known as regional transmission organizations or independent system operators, RTOs or ISOs. Um, these are a central centralized market where supply and demand is, is uh, 
is, is worked out in a marketplace where prices are determined in a marketplace. Um, then there are also what you could call disorganized markets um, or the lack of organized markets in the West and the Southeast. Um, in these regions, each utility is independent, it works on its own, and it may have informal or partial arrangements with its neighbors, <clears throat> but it does not have a single centralized market. Um, there are a number of benefits of big markets. Uh, there's less variation in supply and demand uh, with, if you spread it across a large pool. Um, there's lower risk, uh, like the risk of an outage from a power plant or transmission line. There's a lot more liquidity because there are so many more players in the market. And there's a lot more competition, which helps drive down prices. The energy map of the future, of the clean energy future we're talking about in this 100% collaborative, um, as I said, really relies a lot more on wind and solar. This is a very pretty map from NREL, developed as part of their SEAMS study. Um, and they're really pointing out that the sun belt is all across the south, the wind belt is all across the middle, and in the green area, it's both windy and sunny. Um, and yet, there aren't many people in this wind belt. The people live largely on the coasts. So we need to get the power from where it is to where it needs to go, um, which really underscores the importance of the physical grid, the, the, the need for transmission to move the power, as well as the money grid and the need to move power across different markets, the boundaries of markets, which is why it's called the SEAMS study, because both the physical map and the <clears throat> money map have boundaries between markets that create inefficiencies and barriers. So how does that money and power flow? Uh, on a very obvious level, it flows from power plants through these lightning bolts over to the customers. However, that's met by an equal and opposite flow of money from the customers to the power plants. Both of these are uh, moderated by brokers on both sides, retailers and wholesaler brokers. There are short-term markets and there are long-term markets. Um, the long-term markets can be contracts between uh, a, a customer, a retailer, and an independent power producer or between a, a utility and itself, essentially. Short-term markets are, I'll get to in a minute, they really help balance up the system on the day ahead or the same day. And some of the money goes off to pay for the grid. <clears throat> the market mechanisms, there is the, the long-term market and the day ahead or short-term market up here. Um, and as I mentioned, you have bilateral transactions with independent power producers, which can be of any kind, mostly uh, gas, actually, are most of the independent ones. Um, oh, I'm sorry, gas, wind, and solar, actually, they, uh, make up most of that. Uh, Utility-owned plants self-supply th themselves. The, the utility owns the generator. They use it to power their own customers. Uh, those tend to be older plants, like coal and nuclear and hydro. Um, in the uh, short-term markets, you tend to have more fast-acting independent power generators uh, a lot of gas, especially, um, what are not sometimes called merchant generators because they don't have the security of a long-term contract. And of course, some generators supply both markets. Um, how much is the relative share of these? It changes all the time. It changes from day to day and from year to year. In PJM uh, in 2020, I think it was, um, self-supply from retailers or utilities buying power essentially from their own power plants was about 60% of the market. Um, independent contracts were about 16%. And the short-term market, the day ahead, the 15 minute or the right now market, those are about 25% of the market. <clears throat> um, the market is actually made up of a lot of different products. Um, it's not just energy. Um, energy is the most obvious one. Those are the megawatt hours that we use to run our motors. Um, but we also need to buy capacity. Capacity is the uh, commitment to produce energy at a certain time and place. So if you need to buy energy tomorrow at noon, you need to 
pay someone to be ready to generate that energy at noon tomorrow. Um, not every market requires that because it's sort of implied that if you're going to deliver energy tomorrow at noon, you are going to be available. But in some markets, we actually pay people specifically to be available, um, <clears throat> oftentimes just in case we need them unexpectedly. Uh, about a quarter of the cost of the marketplace is transmission expenses. It's essentially the delivery fee from the power plant to your home. Um, and a, a smaller portion, but very critically important, is a set of ser services known as ancillary services. Uh, that's things like um, making sure the frequency and the voltage works on the grid, um, making sure that uh, power, make, uh, power plants that ramp up and down as demand ramps up and down so we can make sure we don't have any gaps, we don't drop any customers. Um, but it's not very much money. It is very important though. And lastly, uh, I'll mention that there are renewable energy credits. All of the states in our collaborative have renewable energy laws. Um, and they use credits to track compliance. Um, those credits are traded in the marketplace and the price can range uh, very widely as well. There are a number of constraints on the market that can affect prices in all of these categories. Uh, the generation capacity that's available um, on a hot summer day, if there's too much demand or there's not enough capacity, then the price of energy can skyrocket, can be very, very high if uh, there's a capacity constraint. Um, the price of fuel can affect prices. Um, congestion on the grid can certainly affect energy prices as well as transmission prices. Um, some states have prices on emissions uh, that affect the market prices and so on. <clears throat> um, markets can also be local. There are these those regional ones I showed on the map, but they can also be very hyper-local, in fact. Um, these Varying prices are no, known as locational marginal prices, or LMPs. Uh, this is a map of Texas with all of its nodes. Each of these little dots is a node that sets a price in a different way because um, you want to illustrate the relationship between the generator and the customers uh, and the impact of congestion in delivering that power. Um, so the prices are used to illustrate where there's congestion, where there's not enough supply or too much demand. Um, it provides very detailed signals to the market actors, both the consumers and the producers. It would tell a, a producer, for example, this is a very low price, so maybe we need more transmission up here, or we probably don't need any more generation at this hour. Down here, where it's dark red, these are very high prices. Maybe we need more generation, or maybe consumers need to dial back, things like that. Uh, it really increases the efficiency of the market to have these very specific prices. Um, so marginal cost, that's a term I mentioned, um, and this is a very important 101 uh, power markets term. Um, it illustrates the difference between capital and O&M. The capital is the cost of a generator, for example, um, to build it. Uh, the O&M, the operations and maintenance, is the cost of running it. Uh, that O&M also can include fuel. Um, capital is what we call a sunk cost. Once you build that plant, it's you've spent the money and it's there. Um, there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, you can't change your mind after it's built. The marginal cost, however, <clears throat> is not a sunk cost. That's the cost of operating. That's essentially the next shovel full of coal that you shovel into the power plant. Um, the cost of the fuel is the marginal cost along with <clears throat> other O&M operations and maintenance costs. Um, and as I mentioned, the critical thing about wind and solar is that their marginal costs are extremely low. The next photon of sunlight doesn't cost you anything. The next puff of wind doesn't cost anything. Uh, there is a, you know, there are other small operation costs, but uh, largely um, the next unit of energy uh, doesn't cost anything or much. <clears throat> So to illustrate um, how the market translates this concept of marginal cost into a functioning market, um, we're going to talk about what's known as the merit order. Um, this is an awesome little calculator from uh, Michael Weber, a professor at University of Texas at Austin. 
Um, and we'll go to it in a minute, but I want to uh, give you the overview of it first. Um, imagine that these are all different power plants, coal, gas, nuclear, wind, hydro, um, and they're color coded. So you can see how they line up in this uh, order. <clears throat> On the horizontal axis, we have the amount of demand or the amount of capacity in the market. Um, in, in gigawatts. And this is all based on the Texas market from 2013. On the vertical axis is the marginal price, the price per megawatt hour. So in this screenshot, the demand is at 70 gigawatts. The marginal clearing price is at $66 per megawatt hour. How do you get that marginal clearing price? <clears throat> you line up all these bids in order, in price order. And when you hit how much demand is in the marketplace, that determines the price. Everybody who is chosen up until that point gets the market clearing price, no matter how much they bid. Um, this is economically efficient because this way, people will bid their, their marginal cost instead of what they think the market will be, and it ends up being more efficient. Uh, just ask an economist about that if you want more details. Um, there are such a thing as uh, price takers. As I mentioned, wind and solar um, have very low marginal cost, so they can basically bid zero if they want because they know they're not gonna get paid zero. They're gonna get paid this marginal clearing price. Um, <clears throat> plants that have high marginal costs, for example, a gas combustion turbine um, that is fairly low efficiency and does not operate a lot, um, they will always bid high, um, and they may not get dispatched because um, the demand may not be high enough. They tend to make all their money when demand is high. So I'm going to take a minute to show you this calculator, and you can certainly go play with it uh, on your own time, but just to illustrate some of the points I'm talking about. Um, so you can adjust the fuel prices here, and let's say gas prices are much higher. You can see in the Texas market, there is a lot of gas, a lot of gas generators, and the price of their production is highly dependent on the price of fuel. So <clears throat> if price is high or at $10, this really drives up the clearing price of energy in Texas to $108 in this case. Um, if the price of gas is low, it really drives the price down because the pr gas is setting the price. Um, let's say coal gets really cheap, or I'm sorry, let's say it gets really expensive, then you can see some gas and some coal plants will compete with each other for that dispatch. Um, <clears throat> let's say demand is um, very low. Um, let's say it's springtime in March and there are no air conditioners running. Um, the marginal clearing price can drop very low, and you can see different uh, in this particular case, no gas plants are dispatched. Um, <clears throat> solar is growing very quickly in Texas. There's something like 100 gigawatts of wind or solar in the in the queue in Texas. Um, that's a lot. So you can see that solar is going to uh, start affecting things dramatically <clears throat> as it grows. Um, and as you can see, there are times when if demand is low enough, and wind and solar output is high enough, the mark the market clearing price can actually fall to zero, which is pretty funky. But we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> um, so I recommend playing with that and contemplating that that model. It's very interesting. So a little sidebar: um, customers don't see this. I mean, your bill doesn't jump around like this um, normally. Um, most customer bills are moderated through brokers. Brokers <clears throat> aggregate a portfolio for the customers, and the customers pay an average price based on that portfolio, um, the average price for that month, or even longer term if it's a regulated market. Um, rate designs can reflect uh, peak and off-peak prices, so you can have you know predictable bins where a Sunday, summer afternoon have high prices and other periods have low prices, peak and off-peak, also known as time of use pricing. Um, a few customers, a few brave customers, uh, use dynamic pricing, usually large industrial customers that have flexible loads. 
Um, that way they can get access to these real-time market prices that can be extremely variable. They can be extremely low and they can save a lot of money. However, that can be pretty high risk. And we that risk was illustrated in Texas this year um, with the great uh, freeze, the power, the, the hurricane, what was it called? Hur not hurricane, but the storm was named Uri for some reason, uh, a winter storm. This is, a, this is an actual photo of a home in Texas where the pipes froze and the water came through the ceiling and <laughs> had actual icicles in this poor person's house because the power was out for about six days in Texas. Um, this company, Gritty, gave smart shoppers a special deal. Uh, they could pay the wholesale price of power um, along with a small fixed fee. And this was great in normal conditions. You could get free nights and weekends. But when the power crisis hit during the storm, power prices exploded to something like $10,000 per megawatt hour. It's normally maybe $40. So Gritty customers got socked with enormous bills, which they couldn't pay. Gritty, of course, went out of business. It's no longer on. It is now off. Um, so it's really the role of the broker to moderate between the risk and variation of the wholesale market and what the customer uh, wants to pay, which is a more predictable price in most cases. Um, so a broker will assemble a portfolio. They'll, they'll predict what demand their customers will need. And a broker can be a utility most often, but also um, a retail power supplier known as a, an electric service provider or uh, a load serving entity, depends on where you are. But the, the retailer is the broker where they compile a portfolio based on what their customers are gonna need in the near future. Um, and they try to assemble that po portfolio as the least cost, um, the best fit for their needs, and the least risk, uh, so they're not exposed to danger. So they mostly do that with a, a collection of long-term contracts from different types of resources. Um, but they try to keep some flexibility in their portfolio uh, for short term in case they don't exactly predict what their customers are going to need. If they buy too much, they can sell their surplus back into the market. If they don't buy enough, they can go to the short term market and buy what they need. <clears throat> so they play a critical role in smoothing everything out. So that's the tangent about that market dynamic. Um, the real, uh, getting back to the 100% question, solar and wind can have um, dramatic impacts if they start showing up in large amounts. Um, that, uh, that order of generators in that bid stack is called the merit order. Um, and as, they, as wind and solar start to expand, it pushes other plants out of the order. This is, um, we can, I can take you here to see the, give you a quick look at the California real-time market. This was from um, yesterday or the day before. I think I just grabbed a screenshot. At the time, renewable energy was two thirds of the California market, the CAISO market. And most of that was solar power. So Cal solar was about half the market at that moment. Um, you can see, this is the green line for renewables. Um, <clears throat> and I'll take you quickly to that uh, Kaiso page. They give this great real time. You can also get this on an app on your phone in case you want to not be separated from it at any time, like me. Uh, this is right now in California, uh, 10:25 in the morning. Um, we are once again at 70% renewables, and almost all of that is solar. 84% of that is solar. So we are well over half um, of the power supply from solar. Um, you can see <laughs> it comes up every day with the sun. So this is a great big mountain of sunshine um, on the power supply. Uh, we are currently at 13 gigawatts of uh, wholesale solar on the market. That does not include solar on people's homes, which is about another 11 gigawatts of rooftop capacity. So um, uh, you can very nicely go back and look at previous days. Um, these days, it's all kind of the same. Lots of sunshine in the day. Um, at night, when the sun goes down, we make up with it with uh, natural gas and with imports largely. 
Um, this nice uh, site also will disclose emissions <clears throat> uh, in real time as well as prices. Um, I'm not sure if this price map will load. It wasn't loading before, but it shows you the real time prices in every um, every node in California. <clears throat> so with that much solar, um, it's going to create some impacts on prices. The same thing can happen with wind, um, not so much in California, but in the Midwest, in the wind belt. Uh, MISO and SPP, the Southwest Power Pool, can have extremely large amounts of wind power sometimes, um, a majority of the power. In fact, the majority of Iowa's electricity now comes from wind power. Um, <clears throat> and they make these nice uh, heat maps um, that are color coded according to prices. And you can see the critical role of transmission um, on their figures. And we'll take one last look at the MISO map. This is also real time. Um, the color coding shows the range of prices all the way from negative $1,000 to positive $1,000. Um, this purple area is a highly congested area. It is often uh, seeing negative prices here in um, northeast South Dakota, this corner of the Dakotas. Um, current price at this node is minus $35 per megawatt hour. Um, over here in Illinois, Indiana, prices are more normal, maybe $30, $40 per megawatt hour. And you can see how the prices vary. Um, a lot of this has to do with the fact that there's so much wind power generation up here and so little load. Uh, one cool feature, I don't know if this will work well, but it shows a, it, you can have a playback of uh, what's been happening in recent um, time slots over the last couple of days. And you can see the price fluctuates all the time. Um, these are the locational marginal prices that are delivering price signals to market actors, as I mentioned. So it's telling people, you can see these prices up here in the Dakotas are always low, almost always low. That shows that there's not enough transmission to get that power out of the region. <clears throat> if you could get the power out of the region, you would deliver that low cost energy to the rest of the area. Okay, another fun toy to play with when you have the time. <clears throat> so does this mean wind and solar are free? Uh, no, they're not free. <laughs> it costs money to make those things. They have very low or zero marginal cost, but they're not free. Um, another odd thing about wind and solar is that they drive down prices by producing. When they produce the most, that's when prices go down. So that could be a big problem when, if, you know, in California, when we have that much sunshine every day, that much solar power, does that mean the solar companies don't get paid because the price goes to zero or negative? No, they, they do get paid. Um, they're insulated from those market clearing prices in the short term market because they sign contracts for long term delivery. So um, they're still getting paid for that power. Uh, the very affordable price contracts these days in the order of $30 per megawatt hour, it's some of the most affordable energy you can buy. Um, in the long run though, <clears throat> the difference between the short-term market and the long-term market erodes. Um, buyers will seek, will want those very low prices. They want those very low solar prices. And they will be tempted to go on to the spot market to buy those price to buy that power. It's a risky strategy, um, but that's they will have incentives to do that. So this will put downward pressure on the prices for wind and solar um, because the value will be declining. <clears throat> Another way to think about the short-term market is that it's kind of a residual market. It's really not the whole market. Not as I showed on those previous charts. Not everybody is in that merit order market at all, all times. Um, it's really primarily, when we think about a world with lots of wind and solar, that short-term market is gonna be sort of where you make up the rest of what you need. <clears throat> so does this mean we need to redesign markets altogether? Uh, this is a very difficult question and it's actually a future research question for us. Um, markets work 
This is the fundamentals of markets. They match buyers and sellers. They bring them together so they can have a transaction. Markets discover prices. They tell the buyer and the seller how much to pay for that product and how much to sell the product for. Uh, that's price discovery. If there's too much solar in the market and prices go super low, it tells producers to stop producing so much solar, right? But it also tells consumers to consume more solar because it's cheap. So <clears throat> another market response will be that consumption will shift. Uh, more people will consume power in the daytime when it's cheap and less will consume it at night when it's more expensive, which is a reversal of where we are now. Um, some of these shifts will be are already happening, things like batteries. People install batteries, including solar generators, install large batteries to consume that cheap power in the daytime and then sell it at night. Um, EV charging, electric vehicle charging, will more often shift to the daytime because it will be cheaper to do that. So there will be financial incentives to help people or to encourage people to adapt to these changing market conditions. <clears throat> so um, just to wrap up, uh, we are gonna be looking at a number of topics in the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative um, and also in the wholesale markets part of that. Um, a big question is what is the best market design? Do we need to change the market? There are a number of um, very thick reports from some very smart people that we're gonna be wading into and trying to understand and explain and make sense of. Um, another interesting related problem is what, what I call the problem of the last 10%. Um, studies have shown that we can do lots and lots of wind power and solar power and batteries um, for affordably, uh, you know, an affordable amount um, without really affecting the price of energy that we pay now. Um, the problem is what happens when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine at the same time? What else do we do? And that's about maybe 10% of the problem. Um, what do we do to fill in that last 10%? Um, are we gonna have lots of nuclear power? Do we need a huge amount of batteries? Do we need other resources that we haven't really developed yet? <clears throat> um, we're gonna be looking into explain how energy models work. Um, the models that people use for these things, like how do we get to 100%, um, we really need to understand what goes into them and how they function in order to uh, understand what we can learn from them and take away and apply. <clears throat> um, and it's certainly clear that we need a lot more transmission to connect the windy and solar sunny areas to where the people live. Yet transmission has been very difficult to build. Um, it crosses those boundaries between the physical markets and between the money markets. So um, it's gonna be a, a big political problem and policy design problem to make it possible to build that transmission that we're gonna need. So these are a number of topics we're gonna be digging into. Um, and you can certainly join us and follow along at, um, at csud.org slash 100. Uh, sign up for our newsletters, um, follow us on social media and read our reports. All right. Um, <clears throat> That's uh, that's my presentation, and we're going to open it up for some questions. Um, I think uh, I hope people. I believe people have been uh, writing questions in the yeah, chat. Ben, we have a lot of questions in the queue here. Okay, that great. was a brilliant presentation, but this is a weird and wonderful world of wholesale markets. So it's not <laughs> surprising people have a lot of questions about it. Yeah, and. <laughs> I will start asking you. One person asks, are the plans with high marginal clearing prices what people mean when they refer to peaker plants? Yeah, you bet. Peakers, so um, peakers are fairly cheap to build. They're, they have low capital cost. Um, they tend to consume a lot of gas per megawatt hour because they're not that efficient. Uh, they don't have the two cycles like a combined cycle plant have would have. Um, so they're not very efficient. Um, but most of all, they don't get used very much. Um, they will have a capacity factor uh, or usage rate of maybe 5% of the hours in a year. They might get used, you know, 100 hours a year, 200 hours a year. Um, the rest of the time, they just sit there 
doing nothing. And that's expensive to do nothing because you still have to pay all the capital cost. So um, those peakers live for uh, periods of high demand. Um, those sunny uh, summer afternoons when it's 100 degrees and humid and everybody's got their air conditioner cranked, that's when they make all their money because that's when they run. <clears throat> um, but an interesting thing about the energy transition is that solar and batteries are now taking that away from them. Um, since batteries are more cost effective than they used to be um, and are scaling up, um, they can um, take those peak hours away from the gas peakers. So it's, um, it is starting to erode the, the, the financial uh, proposition of gas peakers. Actually, we had a couple questions about that, and folks want you to say a little bit more about how storage might affect market clearing prices. Yeah, I, storage <clears throat> storage uh, can react very quickly um, to price changes, and the the current big model for it is. Um, that daily arbitrage I mentioned where you shift power from daytime solar to evening when there's no solar. Um, but batteries can also be used um, to affect uh, locational marginal prices that, um, that I showed on those colored maps. Um, when you have a pocket where uh, there's a lot of congestion on the grid, that can, you know, transmission congestion, that can really drive up prices in that pocket. They call it a load pocket. Um, and those prices um, can be very high in cases and recurring. So putting batteries in those pockets can be a way to reduce costs because you charge them up when electricity is cheaper and then you discharge them in the pocket when there's not enough uh, transmission to get through. <clears throat> so that, um, and batteries, of course, can be used on the customer side of the meter as well. Uh, customers can use it to do their own daily arbitrage between on-peak and off-peak rates. Um, <clears throat> they can use it to store up their solar so they can use it for themselves because a number of states are being less generous with their net metering policies. So batteries are kind of a multiple threat to um, economics uh, in a number of different ways. Thank you. Before I ask you more questions, I should have answered the question that we got most frequently from the audience, and that is, will they be able to get the slides and the webinar recording after this webinar is over? And the answer is yes. You will get an email to that effect um, in the next couple of days. But on top of that, you can always go to the CISA website and see the slides and recordings from all the webinars we've had over the years. Let me turn to a different question for you, Ben. Um, somebody was asking about negative prices. He says, I get zero, but not negative. What would be the benefit of somebody taking advantage of a negative price? Yeah, I, I thought about putting that in there, and then, then I thought it was not a one-on-one -on -one topic because it's a little uh, confusing. Um, how can a negative price happen? Why would you? Why would a generator sell their power into pay to put their power into the marketplace? Um, and there are a couple of reasons why that happens. Well, first of all, a negative price is just an indication that there's too much supply. It's the same as a low price or a zero price. Um, so zero is really kind of a, not always a, a, a real boundary. Um, but the reason why prices would go negative, um, uh, there are a few reasons. One is um, some generators have a hard time ramping up and down. Um, if you shut off a nuclear plant, it can take a day or two to bring it back up. It's a great big, I think of it as a great big um, teapot of boiling water. Um, and if the water, um, stops boiling, it takes a long time to get it boiling again. Um, so some big thermal plants have a hard time ramping up and down a lot. Um, some renewable projects, uh, wind and solar, um, wind especially, um, benefits from what's called the production tax credit. That's a federal tax credit based on the energy produced. 
um, if you don't produce the energy, you don't get the tax credit. That tax credit is worth maybe $20 a megawatt hour, depending on the vintage of the plant. Um, so they are willing to go to minus $20 um, and still make a profit because they know they're going to get that tax credit. If it goes below minus 20, they may get out of the market because then they're losing money. Um, <clears throat> with solar, uh, the main tax credit is an investment tax credit. So it's not tied to the energy production, it's tied to the investment. So solar is much less interested in going into negative territory uh, because they don't make up, uh, make up the money. Thank you. And someone else was asking, when wind or solar energy is sold on a long-term contract, how does that work given the fact that the power available from those generators varies from moment to moment? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, they're, um, the, the contracts are, some power contracts are structured for delivering power at a certain time and place and quantity. Um, that's a lot easier to do with a dispatchable power plant, like a gas or coal plant. Um, it's harder to do with wind and solar because you're not entirely sure that the wind is going to be blowing or the sun's going to be shining. Um, solar, frankly, is it's a it's it's pretty obvious when the sun is shining, um, uh, depending on the weather, which is predictable. So uh, wind can be a little less predictable, <clears throat> but I think the the answer to the question is that solar and wind contracts tend to be not for um, a certain time of delivery, but for you know we'll take whatever you've got. Um, at, at, at this price. Um, and the wind and solar companies will do, they, they have a relationship with the short-term market. Uh, there's a strategy known as contracts for differences, uh, which is definitely a 201 topic, but um, they, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the, the price is, they, they have to deliver at a certain price to the customer who has the contract, but in the interim, they might be in the short-term market um, selling and buying the power. So it, anyway, I don't want to get into that too much, but um, uh, the, mostly to say that the wind and solar contracts are not as binding as other types of contracts. Uh, and this is another reason why the short-term market exists is to make up the shortfalls um, or the surpluses um, of wind and solar that are different from what their market or from, from what their contract says. Yes. Well, one of the issues you raised is that renewable generation that's nature driven can cause problems with balancing things out with other generators and cause issues for keeping the system running. At what percentage levels of renewable penetration does gri the grid start experiencing grid balancing issues? Um, like physical issues of keeping the lights on. Um, I would say that's not really a problem because we can, <clears throat> we need enough capacity in the system um, to run it regardless of weather conditions, right? Um, that's known as the reserve margin. We need, if, if we think that power demand is going to be 100 units, we want to have 115 or 120 available, uh, just in case some of those units don't show up or they, or they break down or something. So, um, we always need capacity, no matter what our resource mix looks like. Um, <clears throat> wind and solar are not very good at providing capacity. Uh, especially during certain hours. So we tend to have other resources that provide that capacity. Um, a lot of gas turbines, for example, or increasingly storage, but also hydro, nuclear, really everything else. Um, there's a growing interest in using uh, the demand side to as capacity, where we can have customers who will curtail their demand when needed, and we count that as capacity. <clears throat> um, but on the flip side, if we have too much wind and solar, um, 
it gets curtailed. We shut it off, um, especially in the springtime in California, for example, <clears throat> um, when there's a lot of hydropower running off the mountains and there's not a lot of demand because it's not really hot yet. Um, we'll, we routinely shut off a lot of solar, uh, frankly, this time of year, March, April, um, because it's easy to shut off. You just flick a switch. Um, wind uh, can also be curtailed in regions that have a lot of congestion. Uh, Texas, uh, Oklahoma, the Midwest, you'll have these pockets where there's too much wind generation. It can be 100% of demand, and sometimes it can be 150%, and you have to shut some of the turbines off. So um, curtailment, some people think, is a horrible thing to be avoided. But it, frankly, it's a, it's a very easy strategy, and it's very affordable to do it. You pay the, the curtailed generator uh, a little bit, and they're, they don't complain. And you keep the lights on. So curtailment is going to be a common feature of a clean energy future. Thank you. In one of your slides, you showed the breakdown between the different components of energy costs between energy and transmission and ancillary services and so on. Right. Uh, do you think that's likely to change significantly as hmm. distributed energy resources become more common and as the mix of different um, energy sources changes? Yeah, that's a really good question. <clears throat> um, I think it's true. I think energy um, will be less of the market because wind and solar produce energy, but not a lot of capacity. Um, so, and wind and solar are cheap and they will be plentiful, um, which will drive down the price of it. Capacity, at the same time, it will put a premium on capacity because we're gonna need capacity to make up for the lack of capacity we get from wind and solar. So I think we'll see more money put into capacity, less into energy. Um, you know, ancillary services, I'm, I'm a, an affiliate at, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab here, and um, our group has done, has done a lot of uh, very graduate level, PhD level research on this stuff. And um, ancillary services are um, ideal for batteries. Batteries are great at providing ancillary services, very quick acting. You can put them anywhere you want on the grid to provide support for frequency and uh, voltage. Um, but <laughs> there's not all that much need for ancillary services. So it doesn't take a lot of batteries to saturate that market. Um, there will be probably more need for it with wind and solar, um, but probably not that much more. But yeah, I think energy less, capacity more, uh, a little more ancillary services. Thanks. Well, you know, you talk about the rise of renewables with their variable output. Uh, and that led this person to ask two questions. Does that suggest that wholesale prices are likely to become more volatile over time as there's more renewables on the grid? And if that's the case, what could be done to address that volatility? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, yeah, I think definitely they will become more volatile. Um, and I think the, the solution to that is to create larger markets. Um, with a larger market, you, have, you reduce the variability. Um, you know, if you have a market that stretches all the way from, say, Duluth to New Orleans, uh, as MISO does now, um, you get a lot of variability um, that gets smoothed out. Um, the weather is very different <laughs> between Duluth and New Orleans, uh, the type of generators, you have a larger set of generators, so they have different characteristics, they're not all synchronized. The wind may be blowing a lot more um, in, I don't know, Arkansas than it is in Minnesota or vice versa. Um, so as you get bigger markets, that can help reduce the variability of, of uh, prices and, of, of, and also reduce all the risks and um, <clears throat> create more liquidity and more competition. 
So I, you know, I, I kind of think that we're going to see a merger someday between MISO and, and the Southwest Power Pool. Um, I think we're going to see organized markets created in the West, especially maybe someday in the Southeast, maybe not. Um, but uh, you know, I think the there are a lot of good economic reasons to aggregate markets, um, create more physical connections between them that will help reduce the variability uh, from from renewables. Good. You had talked about the issue of transmission and the large wind resources in the upper Midwest and imply that it would be desirable to expand transmission from there to the coast, especially towards the east. But um, how will offshore wind development affect that? Will that reduce the need for large scale transmission from those locations in the upper Midwest? Yeah, uh, it certainly will. Um, they will be com competitors in a certain way. Um, <clears throat> Up until recently, um, the assumption was that it was going to be a lot cheaper to do onshore wind in the Midwest and build long transmission lines, even though these lines are expensive. <clears throat> um, however, uh, what we're seeing really good positive trends in the price of offshore wind, um, especially in Northern Europe, the prices have come down quite a bit. So they're still higher than onshore, but um, they're cheaper than the combination of onshore and long transmission, you know? So delivering wind power to New York State from Minnesota is probably more expensive than delivering it to New York State from, you know, offshore Long Island. Um, even though the, the, the equipment costs are higher for offshore wind. So I think um, it'll be interesting to see, I, I think that that's pretty, straightforward because there's so much more experience with uh, seabed mounted offshore wind in Europe and other places. So I think we're just transferring their technology here. Um, what's going to be more of a wild card is going to be floating turbines off the west coast. Uh, the western seabed drops off very quickly so you can't really have offshore wind mounted on the seabed so much here. So we're going to have to develop floating turbines which are not really commercial anywhere. So um, we'll see um, how that affects it. Um, in the West too, the, the renewable resource is enormous um, from wind and solar, especially, as well as geothermal and biomass. Um, so uh, I'm not sure that offshore wind will be, will be as competitive with onshore wind and solar because we have so much of it in the West. But I think in the East, um, it's going to be uh, offshore wind will be very large. Well, thank you very much, Ben. I'm going to, in a second, give you a minute to re-emphasize any point or say anything else you want to say. I do have to say to the audience that um, we unfortunately will not have time to get to your many questions. We tried to get to as many as we could. Um, please write in if you have suggestions for additional webinars or sessions through the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative, and we'll see what we could do to accommodate your requests. Um, ben, do you have any famous last words for the audience? Well, yeah, I just want to thank all of this, uh, all the students for coming to the lecture hall today, mm -hmm. um, and uh, remind you that there is reading on the website, um, as well as newsletters and other good things to follow along with. So um, I hope you'll uh, join us in our 100% collaborative. Hey, thanks very much, Ben. And thanks all of you for attending. And we hope to see you at future webinars. Bye now. <laughs>